This lecture is an introduction to Egyptian art, Egyptian art that was produced during four of the five historical periods that we see art production. Now this lecture is going to cover art from the pre-dynastic period, which we don't see listed on the screen. Uh, and that's because I'm not really going to cover the pre-dynastic period except for just one image that kind of sets the scene for uh, some of the art that we're going to look at in later parts of the lecture. So we have the pre-dynastic period, the early dynastic period, the old kingdom period, and the middle kingdom period. Now there's a fifth period, the new kingdom period, but that's, a sec that's going to be a whole separate lecture, so not going to be included in what we see here. Now, if you look at the dating of these periods, you can see that the dating is a little inconsistent, that we're seeing times where there is overlap, we are seeing places where there's gaps, and the reason why is because truly technical accurate dating of Egyptian art was actually done dynastically um, along the lines of affiliated ruling groups. There were 31 dynasties in Egypt's history and it's a little bit easier for new people that are coming into the study of Egyptian art for the first time to look at a wider chronological designation, five different areas of time rather than being super specific, breaking it up into 31 different periods of time. Now an important thing, there's two important things for us to consider before we get into um, we get into uh, the art that we're going to be looking at in this lecture. We have our map here, Egypt, and you can see like other maps that we've seen in this class that water is a very important feature of the geography and that Egyptian civilization was kind of distributed along the waterways of the Nile River. The Nile River was extremely, extremely important to the Egyptians as one of the, if not the, sole source of sustenance, providing water to uh, irrigate the crops, um, you know, water needed for livestock and things like that. The other important thing for us to consider is the political situation because we know that the political situation is very important in terms of the type of art that's commissioned during a certain period. For the Egyptians, their power was consolidated into one ruler who ruled over the entire area and that was the pharaoh. Now for the Egyptians themselves, they felt that their history began when the first person who became the first pharaoh unified Upper and Lower Egypt. This is Lower Egypt, this is Upper. Now this might be confusing, it always confuses me. You would think that Upper Egypt would be up at the top, but actually the, the naming of Lower and Upper Egypt has to do with the direction that the Nile flows. Alright, let's take a look at um, some work. We're going to start with our single pre-dynastic piece, again to just kind of set the stage for things to come. Now, um, I wanted to show you this because this is one of the first works that the Egyptians produced. It's one of the earlier works that has ever been discovered and it does date to um, the time that many people think that the Egyptians began to settle in permanent uh, settlements along the Nile River. And of course we're able to determine this based off of archaeological evidence such as pieces of pottery and fragments of paintings, fragments like the one that you see here. Now this is a tomb painting, so the subject matter is funerary, and what we're looking at is we're looking at boats, these boomerang shapes are boats, and it's believed that we're looking at boats that are transporting funerary goods along the Nile River. Now the boats are very important, they factor in uh, quite a bit and in very important ways to Egyptian beliefs about burial rituals as well as Egyptian beliefs about the afterlife in general. Now for the upper classes, more particularly the pharaoh, when the pharaoh would pass away they would load onto boats the funerary objects, um, things that were needed for the burial ritual as well as objects that the pharaoh would take with him into the afterlife. These boats were ceremoniously sailed down the Nile River and then um, they would be uh, transported to the front of the burial structure and this was something that was happening at least through to the end of the Old Kingdom period, maybe even a little bit before the end of the Old Kingdom period.
So this is why scholars believe that these objects that you see here are likely these type of goods for burial and for uh, part of the funerary ritual. So that's something important to keep in mind. Now there's one other part of this painting that's important, but I want to wait and come back to it once we can look at another artwork that will explain why this motif is important. So we're moving on, but just temporarily. Now we move on to the palette of King Narmer. Um, King Narmer was the first pharaoh of Egypt. He's also known as Nemes. Um, Egyptian pharaohs actually had many names, so sometimes this can get a little bit confusing when trying to identify a work that's affiliated with a specific pharaoh. Now the palette in general is a functional object used to uh, hold in the hand and the depression that you see right here was where they would grind the pigment that they would put under their eye to shield their eyes from the glare of the sun. Now looking at the size of this palette, two feet one inch, as well as the significant amount of artistry invested into this object, as well as the fact that it is communicating extremely important subject matter, all three of these indicate that this palette no longer had a functional use but had been elevated simply to an object of art and this is something that's very common during the ancient period. Now we have two sides here and I have line drawings that I put underneath just in case you can't quite see um, clearly what we have here in the actual palette. Now we'll start on the front side here and it is my hope that at this point you will be able to recognize certain compositional conventions that will help you to identify who Narmer is as the main focus within this composition. So hopefully you've been able to identify things like the use of hierarchical scale, central placement, as well as implied line to lead the viewer's eye to this central figure who is Narmer. Now in this image we have Narmer and he has his arm raised, the mace, and he is getting ready to smite a submissive captive. You'll notice that the captive is nude. This is important because the nudity is another symbol for being submissive or being vulnerable. This idea of the pharaoh smiting a captive is extremely important. It is something that we see here in this palette. It is used consistently throughout the rest of Egypt's history. And in fact, this is what makes this palette so important, is that it actually institutionalizes many symbols of kingship that virtually every pharaoh in some combination uses throughout the rest of Egypt's history. So this really is the, the image that standardizes the way the kings represent themselves in art. Now the smiting captive, even though we see this here, this isn't the first time that this ever appears in Egyptian art. This is where we come back to the wall painting. If you look down in the corner here, this is an image of captives being smited. So straight away in Egyptian art, this becomes a theme, and it becomes a political theme with the palette of King Narmer. It shows that he is strong, that he is powerful, that his enemies are submissive, but also that he's protecting Egypt. This seems to be a common theme in Egyptian art is that the pharaoh is conceived of as being a protector. You can see in this register below here are some captives that look like they are deceased so he is kind of simultaneously trampling on captives and smiting them at the same time. He has his left foot forward. This is very important. This is considered to be a very masculine stance to show that he is active, that he is actively looking um, out for the Egyptians ruling over protecting actively being a king. This bowling pin hat that he wears, this is the crown of Upper Egypt called the head jet, so a symbol of Upper Egypt. And we have here the falcon Horus who's holding on to this papyrus that um, has these, these flowers in here. And uh, these are uh, papyrus and this together represents Lower Egypt. So even though we have an iconographical symbol of Upper, we additionally have a separate symbol of Lower, which is to show that he is going to eventually unite Upper and Lower Egypt. Now on the back, okay, we have our three registers. We'll start at the top and work our way down. Here again we have Narmer, seen through hierarchical scale, shown as a military leader. 
Here, though, he wears the deshret, which is the crown of lower Egypt. And um, here we have the defeated army, severed heads between the feet, severed heads also commonly seen in the more violent imagery coming out of Mesopotamia. A lot of links exist between Egypt and Mesopotamia. Down here we have these extended feline heads that wrap around the uh, depression here. The feline heads could be a representation of the unity of upper and lower Egypt, which is very important to um, the idea of being a pharaoh. It also can be a representation of protection, right, which was also something that was kind of being referred to here, the idea that it is the pharaoh's responsibility to protect Egypt. And then just in case like you kind of miss that Narmer is a super powerful guy who is able to achieve his power through his sheer brute strength, here you have Narmer in the guise of a horned bull knocking down a city's fortification while trampling a captive. All right, we move on to Egyptian burial art. And what we see with Egyptian funerary structures is what I call the evolution of Egyptian burial structures, meaning that they start with what we see here, the mastaba, and they actually shift and change in related ways over time. So you will need to know for your exam the evolution of the burial structure, not only what structure came next, but also the why. Why do they transition between these different structures rather than simply just keeping with the same structure all along? Now for many people, the most familiar of the Egyptian burial structures is the pyramid, but the pyramid was not the first um, iteration of Egyptian burial structures. Believe it or not, it's actually the third. The first is the mastaba, which is Arabic for bench. Basically, it's like a pyramid with the top cut off. Hmm, that sure looks similar to another structure that we have studied in this class. And if you're thinking it looks a lot like the Mesopotamian ziggurat, you are right. So we have a structure that's based off of, in appearance, the Mesopotamian ziggurat. But do keep in mind that the functions are different. The ziggurat is a religious structure, while the mastaba is a tomb. Now, these tombs... Um, they varied. Sometimes they would house a single individual. Sometimes they would house multiple individuals. You have here, in this drawing, you have an opening. And sometimes there would be um, the opening, like we see here, that would lead into a mortuary chapel. Other times there would be no opening, and you would have a um, separate structure that acted as the mortuary cha chapel directly next to the mastaba. The mortuary chapel would contain within it some sort of likeness of the deceased, usually in sculptural form, and then it had representations, painting or relief sculpture, that showed um, food and sometimes activities and all kinds of things that the uh, deceased would be able to take with them into the afterlife. So this is the first in our steps, the evolution of the Egyptian burial structure, the mastaba. Next, we move to the stepped pyramid. Here we have the stepped pyramid, the first that the Egyptians built, built for the pharaoh Zosier, designed by the very famous Imhotep, who actually was the first artist to have his name recorded in history. Now you can kind of see how this is starting to become like this idea of evolution, in the sense that basically this step pyramid looks like mastabas stacked one on top of the other, getting progressively smaller as we move up. Now, the question is why? Why do we move from a mastaba to a stepped pyramid? Now, obviously, the step pyramid, because it's taller, and we have people right here to give you a sense of scale, because it's taller, Obviously, that's much more of a clear proclamation of power and wealth. The power and the wealth of this pharaoh is so immense that he commands this magnificent burial structure, but also that this power is eternal, that it will always last. In a way, it kind of does, because we're looking at, you know, this image right now. So, I mean, that seems that he was successful in keeping this, this power. His memory certainly is alive and well, even um, in the 21st century. So, the other reason why perhaps they transitioned to this stepped 
pyramid is that they actually were creating what was meant to be steps. The idea that the um, Pharaoh's uh, soul kind of like took stairs, stairway to heaven, right? Took stairs and this shape actually like facilitated him going into the afterlife. He took the stairs. Now, for these burial sites, they did not simply exist only with pyramids. There were actually other structures that were affiliated with the um, the pyramid uh, temples and things like that, as well as spaces for the ritual of burial. Now, in this next slide, these are some views of the mortuary complex of Zosier. So. What we're looking at is we're looking at the uh, the temples that stood in remembrance of the Pharaoh. They're kind of similar to the mortuary chapels I was talking about in the previous slide with the mastaba. So these were places that were um, for the memory. Now unlike those um, mortuary chapels for the mastaba, these are based on the idea of exclusion, keeping people out, which you can see with this this tall wall that runs along the the exterior. With um, the the mortuary chapels with the mastaba, they were more accessible, and family and friends could go in and leave offerings and pay tribute to the deceased. Zosier, though, was so powerful, he did not need nor want everyday people like you and me going in and paying homage to him. He was so important that only the best of the best could go in. And that was in the in the case of, you know, high ranking priests and probably really rich people, family, uh, would be able to go in and to to pay homage, which is why we see this idea of exclusion. But what I am more interested in is columns. This is really exciting because we see the first stone column in art history. Very, very, very exciting. Now there's other things that are exciting about this, okay? We are looking at fluted columns, and the fluting are these lined grooves that we see here. Now the fluting is meant to create this appearance that the column is a bundle of reeds, R-E-E-D-S, you know, the plants that grow in the Nile. And the reason why is because early um, architecture, they actually used bundles of reeds to hold up roof structures. So it's kind of an homage or a reference to the more historical practices of architecture. But now, very exciting, they're using stone. Now over here, here's some other examples of columns. These are not fluted columns. Instead, you have a shaft, which is the body of the column, that is plain. Now we see, though, that we have papyrus and lotus flowers. And the papyrus is for Upper Egypt, lotus flower is for Lower Egypt. So this sort of combination of Upper and Lower Egyptian symbolism, which we saw in the palette of Narmer, we're seeing here as well. Now this isn't just simply, though, meant to be kind of a proclamation of, uh, you know, pharaonic political power, but it's interesting because we're looking at plant imagery and we're seeing it at a a site that's associated with death. Now we know from our studies of Mesopotamia, particularly the, the Warka vase, that a lot of plants have this idea of fertility. So why would we be seeing fertility symbolism at a, at a place that's associated with death and burial? Now if you're guessing rebirth, you would be right, right? The idea of fertility helping to be reborn into the afterlife. This is so, so, so common cross-culturally in, in ancient art, where you see the combination of uh, fertility and death as an indication of rebirth. And now we get to it, the Great Pyramids. So exciting, right? This is one of the architectural marvels, not only of ancient Egypt, but probably of the entire planet. This is our third phase in our Egyptian, evol the evolution of Egyptian burial mounds, going from the Mastaba to the Step Pyramid, and now to what I call the Smooth Slope Pyramids, or I've also seen them referred to as geometric, pu geometric pyramids that have this pyramidal shape. Now, we see that there are three here, and these were built over a course of about 75 years for uh, a ruling family of three, the father, the son, and the grandson, Khufu, Khafra, and Menkare. Now, 
with this okay let's first before we get into the fun facts the pyramids talk about the whys why do they move from the step pyramid to the smooth slope or geometric period pyramid and there's three po four possibilities okay first of all they liked it why could they felt like it why couldn't that be a possibility right maybe they saw that this was like a more mod shape they felt like it so that's one possibility now a second possibility is that um, they were able to achieve greater height with this technique is even more of a proclamation of um, power. These are kind of weak and I feel like you, we should be a little bit more specific in thinking about why we have such a fundamental shift from the step to the smooth slope pyramid. Now one idea is that these were intended to make a connection between the pharaoh and the sun by trying to mimic the sun's rays like imagine this is the sun and in fact in um originally this was topped by this little like gold cap this is the sun shining the rays down right this idea that the sun is like shining directly on the spot where the pharaoh is buried you could probably see how that would be communicating some you know ideas about the pharaoh being really powerful that the sun pretty much just shines straight on his tomb. Now there's also idea that this shape is mimic, meant to mimic the sun's rays and that the sun's rays are kind of like ramps. So instead of like the pharaoh taking stairs, you know, to the afterlife, he's taking a ramp. That's probably easier than than climbing stairs. Now the fourth and my personal favorite of these theories is that these are um, supposed to be symbols of the Ben Ben stone and the Ben Ben stone is the shape of um, stone pyramid that is affiliated with the sun god Ra or Re tomato tomato it doesn't really matter how you want to pronounce that now during this time in the old kingdom period there was a shift in the pantheon of Egyptian deities where the um, the sun god became the most prominent and so it's believed that by taking the symbol of the sun god the ben ben stone placing it directly onto the tomb of the pharaoh it is associating him with this very powerful god and we've seen this with mesopotamia one way to communicate and express power is by affiliating with the gods now additional sun symbolism has to do with the fact that these were initially uh, faced with like a white limestone and so if you can imagine like the intense Egyptian Sun like shining off that that it would be kind of reflecting and it would almost look like the Sun has come down from the sky and is sitting here on the earth right on the Pharaoh's tomb that's pretty intense symbolism pretty intense symbolism now let's talk about some of the interesting facts about the pyramid okay the tallest of the great pyramids is about 500 feet which is around 51 stories tall this made for this structure to be the tallest structure in all of human history at least at this time on all the planet and we don't have a taller structure being built until I believe it was like the 14th or 15th century CE. The point of it being thousands and thousands of years, this is the tallest structure on the planet. Now this tallest pyramid, okay, which is the is Khufu's pyramid, the, the first person, the, the father, has over two million stone blocks and each of these stone blocks weighed about two tons. Now think about this, okay, Think about the fact that there's two million blocks, two tons. They did a little like calculation and they figured that with that, that amount of blocks in this size of a structure, that they these two ton blocks would have to be set into place one stone every two to three minutes. That's crazy. And what's crazier is that it's perfect. These stones are placed so perfectly together that you cannot fit a piece of paper in between each stone. They're placed so perfectly that the structure itself is perfect with a 0.015% margin of error. We can't replicate this today with our computers and our you know cranes and all of our modern technology. They tried to build that pyramid in Luxor at Las Vegas, collapsed twice, right? So 
they were able to build these perfect structures that we cannot repl replicate. And to me, that is very interesting and it's very mysterious. These structures have perfect alignment. They are aligned directly with Orion's belt. Many people believe that that specific celestial alignment was like a map to help get the pharaohs into um, the afterlife. Very interesting structures. All right, let's take a look at some sculpture. So we're looking at Old Kingdom period sculpture, and we're looking at an image of King Menkari and his wife. Menkari was one of the pharaohs that was built under the Great Pyramids that we saw on the previous slide. He was the grandson. So we have then in this image a very typical representation in the Old Kingdom period of pharaoh. And it's the, a very particular body type. Okay, that gives us these clues, in addition to some other iconography. We have the pharaoh in his body as being idealized, these terms of perfection. And what that meant for uh, the pharaoh images is that the body is muscular, but not like too muscular. This isn't like crazy muscles, like we're going to start to see in Greece. Muscular, trim, and fit. Okay, and this is the typical body type of pharaohs at this time. You can see that he is stiff with his arms at his sides, fists clenched. It looks like he's holding something in his hand, but actually he wasn't. It was at this time that um, Egyptians were not able to build open form sculpture, which I think is really interesting that they can build a 50 story tall structure that's perfect with a 0.015% margin of error, but they can't make open form sculpture. I just think that that's a little mysterious. Like our Narmer palette, he's in this active masculine pose with the leg stepped forward. We have the kilt. This actually is a common uh, clothing item that we see with the pharaoh. We also see him wearing the nemes headdress and the false beard. So these are also symbols of kingship. Now he's accompanied, as you know, by his wife, and we can see that there's a difference, the treatment of form. The treatment is twofold. It is a way to indicate gender, to let us know we're looking at a woman. She is a conventionally attractive woman, um, which may be that kind of sexual attractiveness, a comment on the fact that her primary role as queen is to have a sexual role to produce a, main, a male heir ideally a male heir. She'll end up producing many heirs. She has her arm around uh, her husband and stands behind him. Many have interpreted that as being like a supportive role. Now, the body type also is not only to indicate gender, but to perhaps indicate hierarchy. Because again, this body type, this idealized body type, indicates the power of the pharaoh. Trim, where we do see a little bit of fleshiness on the form that we see here. Now here's another um, image. This is Khafra, who was the, uh, the, the middle of the, the three pyramids. And this is his Ka figure. Now Ka figures were important. They were kind of like... Um, backup plans. So mummy, mummification was extremely important because it um, ensured that the pharaohs, uh, the pharaoh could live into the afterlife. So if mummification, if anything went wrong, the Egyptians believed that if there was a severing of the tie between the soul and the physical body, that the deceased would no longer exist in the afterlife. That is a sketchy situation, and so what would happen is they would have these Ka figures as a backup plan. They have the likeness of the individual, for the most part, and what happens is, is the mummy becomes damaged uh, during mummification or during like grave robbing, which was endemic during uh, Egypt at this time, that the, the soul could just... Um, make the connection to this and this would this would count. Now we can see that this is again a highly typical representation of a pharaoh during the Old Kingdom period where we have the, the trim and the stiff and the muscular form. We have the nemes headdress and we have the false beard. Here this is called the Semitawi motif which you don't need to know but this is a representation of the unity of Upper and Lower Egypt. So that same symbolism that keeps recurring again and again. 
Now, for these Ka figures, you, what is the most important thing is this sense of permanence. Sense of permanence because this needs to last forever to ensure that this pharaoh will live forever in the afterlife. So we see permanence being suggested through the closed form of the sculpture, how everything's closed in on itself, so it appears very solid. And then, of course, we have a sense of permanence through the very hard stone that has been used to create this sculpture. Now here's a couple more examples of Egyptian sculpture. And this is important because these are sculptures that do not depict pharaohs. And I really hope that you were able to see that pretty quick based solely off of the body type. Now, powerful men, they did have the privilege of having their images in sculpture. The difference in body type was a way to ensure that people would not mistake these men for pharaohs. Now, What's interesting is these sculptures, they indicate hierarchy, but at the same time they don't. And that might sound confusing, so let, let me explain that. Hierarchy, they explain hierarchy in the sense that they exist. That they, they show these men, the seated scribe and Ka Aper, who uh, was a government official, both high-ranking important men in the government. It shows their importance simply because these images exist, so that creates hierarchy. The other thing that's creating hierarchy is actually their body type. So these are kind of fleshier individuals. They have some meat on their bones, which shows that they're not laborers, that they kind of have a more like kind of laid back lifestyle. They sit around. They also have um, access to delicious food. And unfortunately, delicious food is most always fattening. So we see powerful individuals. Now, the thing that shows that they're not as powerful, one, the material, we have very hard stone. Here we have wood. Here painted limestone. Okay, so not as uh, prestigious or valuable of materials. The other thing that does not show hierarchy is a body type. Because it doesn't have, we don't have the trim, stiff physique of the pharaoh. Now there's one other thing I want to point out with before we move on, and that is the individuality of the figures. There's actually a fair amount of portrait likeness that we can see in these individuals. We don't tend to see quite a level of portrait um, likeness in images of the pharaoh. The portrait likeness exists to show that these men, that they're individuals, and the function of a portrait is to show someone's physical likeness. Now for these images, these are images of kingship. They're not in images of the individual Menkare. You know, who's Menkare? What does he like to do for fun on the weekends? Nobody cares. What they care about is that he is a king. And so these tend to be more generic because they're not necessarily specific individuals, although there is differentiation between the different you know, images of pharaohs, but it's more about a representation of the office of kingship. And this is an interesting thing to note because we're going to see this when we get to New Kingdom period images in the next lecture, where it becomes so generic that even gender is not something that's required to be accurately depicted. Now there's more to it than that. I'm going to make you patiently wait for the next lecture, but um, it is something to think about. All right, the Sphinx. So we go back just for one more minute to look at um, art that is coming from the New Kingdom period. I am showing this now because the Sphinx is a sculpture and it actually is considered to be one of the um, largest sculptures in the round that ever was made by man. And it was the first colossal or life-size or excuse me, huge, that's obviously not life-size, huge sculpture to be made in Egypt. And um, this sits in front of the pyramid of Khafre. And people argue that because they say that some of the facial features here are uh, reminiscent of Khafre. We can see that this does carry some of the standard symbols iconography of pharaonic power where he has the nemesis headdress. I'm willing to bet there was originally a false beard here that has come off over time and in fact this has been badly badly eroded um, over time. And then of course the Sphinx also lines directly up with Khafre's pyramid. Now the Sphinx is this hybrid figure half man half animal 
half man is the the pharaoh and then it's some sort of lion lion imagery feline imagery which has been um, traditionally associated as we know with from the power the palette of narmer protection now you can see here that there are disproportionately large size little paws and this is where the idea of protection comes in when we look at it from this angle this looks all wrong but if you are actually to look at the sphinx from really far back the um this would look appropriate this the the scale and the proportions the idea being is that people would encounter this from far away and so they'd be walking up they'd see this like oh scary lion fierce ferocious and they'd be scared they'd run away and they wouldn't want to um, rob the tomb all right now we're going to end with um, rock cut tombs and this is the fourth of our evolution of the Egyptian burial structure Mastaba stepped pyramid smooth sloped or geometric period pyramid and then the rock cut tombs now the rock cut tombs these were discrete tombs cut out of the side of the rock these rock formations located far away from the city um, and it really just functioned as a way to hide the tombs to preserve the tombs because as i said grave robbing was so endemic so they had to make much more discrete tombs to um, prevent that from happening and if we move here, this is like the entryway. So it's not like you just like walk in and then there's the sarcophagus and all the burial goods. It's a little bit different than that. This is like the kind of entry point. It's a vaulted space, which just means curved ceiling. Okay, Vaulted space and then you go through the door. Now it's not like when you go through the door, there's a sarcophagus. No, it would be uh, kind of like a maze. There'd be false passageways, false stairways, doors that didn't open. So it still would try to thwart any would-be tomb robber. We can see our fluted columns and that these are decorative. That this is showing that these exist simply just as decoration and they really don't have a structural function because we can see that the structure still is able to stand without the um, portion of the column here.